Harrison and Anna Hudson. You've probably heard if you listen to NPR like I do, they've been advertising their incredible native butterfly flowers nursery, which is right off of 192, right on Irwin. I've not been out there. I'm excited to go. Um, I live in an apartment, so I don't have a fabulous garden to go buy native plants. But this spring, when you're thinking about what you're going to do with your yards and you're ready to take out more turf grass and put in some beautiful plant beds and maybe plant a native tree, you know where to go. So I'm excited to have them here with us today talking about what they do. They're all about, they're both horticulturists. Let's see, Tim got his bachelor's in conservation ecology from uh, SU in Savannah. Beautiful Tim. He's been, he's been at this for a long time, since 2005. Anna got her bachelor's in forest management and conservation from UF. Uh, we won't hold that against her. We're big seminals here, mm -hmm. um, but uh, fantastic program. Uh, she's worked as an eco tour guide. She probably has some great stories to share about that. But with that, um, I want to give them a big shout out, uh, let you know where they're located, West Melbourne on Urban Avenue. You can go to their Facebook page or their website, nativebutterflyflowers.com, nativebutterflyflowers.com. With that, I'm going to turn it over. You guys ready? You good? Yeah. All right, take it away. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lisa. That My was a pleasure. great introduction. And we are happy to be here. I'm Anna. I'm Tim. This is Tim. In case you didn't <laughs> got that mixed up. <laughs> and we um, started Native Butterfly Flowers in 2015. Um, we started selling native plants at farmers markets because it was a great way to get out to the people. Um, we, we sell native plants because we feel like it's a really important part of ecology. Like we, we want to do something to help Florida's ecology and Florida's ecosystems and encouraging people to plant things that are productive and healthy and beneficial in their yard to us is a very important and um, useful way to help the ecology of the state. <clears throat> so we um, put together this, I don't know which button am I supposed to be pressing? <laughs> Do you want to advance the slide? Yeah. Can you help us? It was working before. It was working. Uh oh, am I pressing wrong? No. Someone else can do it. Okay. Let's see. Okay. All right, hold on. Let's. Uh... <laughs> it was about two seconds ago. <laughs> anyway, we did put together our presentation is called um, What You Plant Matters, okay. and it'll be up here on the screen. Just sure. <laughs> um, because we travel a lot, we go to a lot of people's yards, we um, talk to a lot of different people, and we really feel like people need to think about that. what they're planting. And so we just brought, um, put together some pictures. I mean, we can do it without the pictures if we need to. Uh, we're um, going to restart the PowerPoint okay. and uh, go from there. So we grow over 150 species of Florida native plants now. Um, we've been expanding and we plan to continue to expand. We have a retail location in West Melbourne at 82 Southwest Irwin Avenue, and we grow our plants at our property in Palm Bay. Hopefully we'll have that open soon. Yep. Within a couple of years. A few years. But, um, currently, um, all of our plants are sold at Irwin Avenue, which has been a really great location. Like I said, we used to do farmer's markets, but the pandemic shut everything down, and we got to open up here in West Melbourne, which has been really exciting for us because we've been able to bring more diversity and more quantity to people. Um, so yeah, we do Try pride ourselves in trying to find every available native yeah. plant out there All right. and have it available. All right. Yay. We have some pictures. <laughs> so we, so what you plant matters to a lot of our native creatures and to the ecosystems around us. Um, you can see a nice picture. We have, we try to focus on creating habitat uh, when we do landscape designs. And even small habitats, especially for pollinators, can create a lot of life into your yard. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> it was working. Okay. 
darn it. So we think about where did it go? The best plants that will attract life to your yard, bring in food, bring in um, resources for the critters around us. And we think that'll help people appreciate natural Florida as well as they see wildlife in their yard and they get familiar with native plants in their own yard. As they go out in nature, they'll start to recognize these plants. They'll all have names. They are more familiar, especially when you're seeing them growing and reproducing and, and bringing life into your yard. All right, so we've got four categories of plants here on the screen. We have Florida native plants, and we have exotic plants. Ah, oh, you got that. And we have naturalized plants and then in invasive exotic plants. So Florida native plants are considered plants that were growing here before Europeans came and settled in North America um, and have been documented to be growing naturally here in Florida. Um, exotic plants are plants that have been brought from other parts of the world, whether on purpose or by accident, um, whether they hitched rides on boats, ships, or they were brought here on purpose for partic other particular reasons, whether they're for ornamental value or for wind breaks in agriculture for other reasons, exotic plants. And then naturalized exotic plants are plants that have overcome reproductive barriers. They're exotic plants that have been brought here, but now they've overcome reproductive barriers and dispersal barriers, and they have spread throughout um, different areas in natural communities. And they're naturalized, so at this point, they're considered naturalized, and they're just living with native plant communities, not necessarily doing anything besides reproducing and mixing in with native plant communities in ecosystems. And then we have invasive exotic plants that are plants that are causing harm, exotic plants that were brought here that are causing harm to ecosystems or have the potential to cause harm out in natural lands. And this is why we think what you plant matters because if you're bringing in plants from other parts of the world, they could possibly have the potential to escape and harm our natural ecosystems. Next. No. Can you guys advance it? Next. My buttons are not working. So, are you missing? No, you didn't. Yeah, that's okay. it. Um, so, invasive plants, I'm starting with the worst invasive plants. Um, so, biological invasion is a very natural thing. There's lots of competition out in the natural world. That's how things evolve. But when you have uh, exotic plants that have been brought here, by people, then that changes everything. It makes it a little more complicated than just plants that have evolved together and have competition. And so bio biological invasion scientists have been studying plants and animals that invade different areas. And they've um, introduced a measure to kind of get an idea of what would be considered invasive maybe before it causes harm. Um, and so a plant that is dispersed by seed, they consider it an invasive plant if it moves over 100 meters within the first 50 years of being planted. Um, then a plant that is spreads through roots or rhizomes, they consider it invasive if it moves over six meters within three years of being planted. So you plant a plant and it can start to spread um, and then the process of invasion is where there is a lag time. So this lag time could exist for decades or it could be short. So an invasive, a plant that has the potential to be invasive could be planted and started to be sold in the horticulture trade. And maybe it's not very popular and then maybe it gets popular in 10 years or it's really popular when it's first introduced. So that would be um, whether or not it becomes invasive or not. If it's not a popular plant, then it may not become invasive even if it had that potential. So if you had a few decades of selling a certain species of plant that's exotic and it gets very popular, 
and lots and lots of people are buying it, that's lots and lots of individuals being put out into the environment or into people's yards where they have that potential to become invasive. Uh oh, we went back to the first slide. <laughs> um, and then. Oh, now we're on the next slide. All right, keep going. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can you go one before that? Um, and so there's an exponential growth. And so there you have the lag time where it appears that, yeah, it appears that nothing's wrong and there's this lag time. And then next thing you know, there's this exponential growth and then they just spread out into the environment. And then it kind of levels off and flattens the curve, kind of like code. <laughs> um, okay, you can go to the next one. Um, Ooh, all right, I did. And the Florida Pl Exotic Pest Plant Council has categorized these plants that have been documented to cause harm or have the potential to cause harm. And so a category one invasive plant is a plant that has already demonstrated that it's causing harm to ecosystems by outcompeting community plant native plant communities and um, disrupting ecosystems and functions within the ecosystems by kind of crowding out others, or they're hybridizing with some of our native plants, um, such as the firebush and porterweed. We have two non-native firebush and porterweed that are hybridizing with our native ones and causing the plant's genetics to change. And you have category two invasive species that have started to spread out into the, the natural world, into conservation land, and they show some potential to become a category one. And so a lot of times the category twos are moved to a category one over time, eventually. So if you go to the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council website, you can get a list of these plants. We'll go over some in a minute, but I just wanted to mention that there are available lists of um, category one and two um, plants out there. Thanks. Um, yeah, so we're going to go over a few of the probably most common ones that we hope that you guys have seen and know that you shouldn't be propagating in your yard. Um, <clears throat> these are category one invasive species, so they have been documented to be causing harm in ecosystems. Um, the one with the bright red berries is um, rosary pea. They're very typically easy to spot. And they're quite red is a very alarming color. They are uh, deathly poisonous to humans, but the birds eat them, which is why they spread. Um, and so they, I, they're quite common in natural areas and they cover things. They'll cover, cover other plants. They have super deep roots, so they're hard to get out. They're very um, intolerant of all areas and can grow pretty much anywhere. <clears throat> um, the tall tree on, in front of the ocean is the Australian pine. Now these were brought here to Florida with the, um, the citrus industry brought them as wind blocks. So they did their job well for what they were brought here for, but they also expanded and reproduced in the wild and took over other um, ecosystems. And the major problem with this tree is that nothing can grow underneath it. It has chemicals in its roots and its leaves and its bark that stop other plants from growing. So when you have Australian pines, that's pretty much all you have. And so they've taken over areas along rivers and along the, the, the beach and the dunes and kind of anywhere. Um, so they're one you, if you have it in your yard, you should be doing ecological services and getting rid of them. <laughs> um, Brazilian pepper, hopefully everyone has heard about that one. Another one that was actually brought here in the horticulture trade, it was sold as a very beautiful plant. It is a beautiful plant. But the birds like the berries. It's quite toxic. And so it just exploded into the landscape. <clears throat> and now you'll see it lining most highways and um, areas where there hasn't been any maintenance. Um, they come into natural areas. They come along the lagoons into the mangroves. And they just, once again, this one also has, um, they're called allopathic chemicals, which prevent other plants from growing underneath them. So you get huge stands of, um, Brazilian pepper with very little underneath it. Um, and you can see the old world climbing fern is altering the ecosystem fairly um, decently over there. There's not a whole lot um, going on underneath all that climbing fern, which is another one that if you see in your landscape, especially if it's little, get it out <laughs> um, because it can really take over and expand. Um, carrot wood, 
I've had, this is one that I have had people ask for once or twice. We, we typically are grateful that nobody asks us for these plants, but um, this one, you see them quite often in people's yards. They grow and people are um, treating them as shade trees because they are pretty tr shade trees, but they also take over mangrove habitat. They are quite coastal um, disturbances. They, um, the birds, once again, spread the berries. And then air potato. You've probably seen that one too. It could be a very pretty little vine, but it takes over, it drops those potatoes, it covers things and every potato grows and the old ones grow and they, they spread like crazy. So these are plants that you have probably seen, you probably know about. People typically don't ask us for them. And that's great, like we are happy, you know, we, that most people know about these plants. Um, but the real concerning thing is that there are more category one invasive species. So these are the ones that have been documented to cause harm that you can actually still buy. You can walk into most nurseries, you can walk into Home Depot, you can walk into Lowe's. And have you seen any of these guys? So you can walk into most nurseries and buy any of these plants. And these are category one invasive species that were, are still being sold, are still being planted. Um, and they are spreading and causing ecological harm. And they're really hard to get rid of if you have them. Um, the oyster plant, every little leaf and seed grows. They, they reproduce all over the place. I've seen them growing on roofs. They grow on the side of oak trees. They, they grow all over the place. Um, Mexican petunia, probably our most common <laughs> sought after category one invasive species here. Oh God, once you get it, it's impossible to get rid of and it just keeps going and going. And um, Lantana camara is a worldwide invasive species. It spreads berries everywhere and is still sold. And then we move into edibles. Like it's great to have edibles in your yard. People love to plant edibles. I love to plant edibles. We like to be able to eat out of our yards, but still you have to be careful. These are small fruits. The birds love them. They carry, they travel far. Remember that it needs to travel um, more than hundred miles or less than hundred miles in 50 years or hundred miles. And these can travel really far and they make really dense thickets once they start reproducing in the wild, um, which changes and alters ecosystems. So strawberry guava and Surinam cherries are both still sold, still sought after but are also category one invasive species. And we wanted to talk to you about, you know, this is why Tim went over, what does category one mean? Because we often tell people that and they don't understand. And so we want you to know that it is documented to cause ecological harm. Asparagus fern, still sold in lots of nurseries. Um, camphor tree, we saw one the other day, a big beautiful one in a pot. Somebody, you know, they were selling it at this nursery. Camphor tree, they, um, they're huge trees and they get into the oak hammocks. They um, have millions of seeds that the birds spread. Um, same with asparagus fern, they, you get these big thickets that are not very nice to get rid of. <laughs> um, and then one of our more recent ones that is, um, so most people hopefully have heard about the paper bark or we call it Malaluca. It was brought into, um, the Everglades to drain the Everglades. Um, it didn't really work. It just took over South Florida. Um, and so now there's huge thickets of um, Malaluca taking over the world of South Florida. And up here, you do see it not quite so often. But the bottle brush tree is a Malaluca. Most people don't realize that, but it is a Malaluca. And it's been planted for years because it's beautiful and it attracts bees and hummingbirds. But only recently has it started being pollinated. It never used to be pollinated. So now something has changed, whether it's the temperature or more pollinators or something has happened that, that bottle brush trees are now getting pollinated. So they have been put onto the category two invasive species list, which is now a species of concern, which means it could very easily be moved into that category one because they can start reproducing and spreading. <clears throat> and so this is where 
knowing the list, knowing what you have, knowing how they have the, the potential to expand is important. Um, the qualities of a plant that the horticulture trade often um, selects for are very similar or are also the, the qualities of a plant that can make them be very successful invasive plants. Um, so they have a long blooming period. People want to have flowers every day of the year, and it's great. Um, they're super low maintenance, so you don't have to do a whole lot of work to keep this plant alive in your landscape. Everybody loves that. We all want low maintenance plants. They're super adaptable, widely adaptable. They can grow anywhere. They don't have to have specific conditions to grow in. Um, they propagate really easily. So you can make cuttings, they reseed themselves. It's really easy to repropagate. You can give them to all your friends because you have so many of them. Um, they're super stress tolerant. So droughts, uh, heat, storms, they can handle all that. Um, and once again, a short juvenile period, which means they reproduce really quickly. And so these are great for horticulture plants, but they're also great for invasive species. Like the, all of those um, attributes are things that make them also expand and reproduce and um, do really well in natural areas. <clears throat> so we like you to think about your yard as more than just like the walls of your house. You, we want you to think about it as like a place where stuff is going on. It's an ecosystem, there's things happening out there. And so when you think about a plant, what is this plant gonna do? It's alive, is it gonna reproduce? Is it gonna change? And how is that? It's not gonna just stay in your yard. And that's, that's the main um, kind of thing we talk about because it's not, just you who's having that problem. Um, and then this is the, the, um, <laughs> this is, this is the, the real problem or the major part of why um, what you plant in your yard is significant. Yeah, so yeah. So there's a lot of development going on in Florida right now, or there has been for a long time, but more now than ever, it seems, especially around here in West Melbourne, Palm Bay. Um, and in Florida, when we, when we do development, apparently we just scrape everything, raise it up and start all over. And so this is a picture of, you know, a new housing development, um, well, it's really close, where it is, not but... that new, but <laughs> really close houses together where they just kind of have to, they raise it up basically because Florida is an old swamp. And so they just scrape it off, raise it up. And then I'll click it. And then, um, take out whatever was there. So if it was um, a prairie or a, or a hammock or a scrub and they just kind of get rid of it all and raise it up and then build houses. And then people, they go out to replant in their yard. And so what we see is all this habitat loss. And then you go to the typical nurseries and you replace it with exotic plants, some of which could be invasive or become invasive over the years, um, but they're exotic plants and they're even exotic plants are not necessarily supportive plants. So we call them non-supportive plants because we believe that planting native plants, we have in Florida, there's about 3000 species of flowering plants that are native to Florida from the panhandle to the keys. And there should be no reason why we can't landscape our yards with beautiful flowers and also provide a source for food and uh, bring life into the yard. So we do a lot of consults and we do landscape design and we visit a lot of people's houses. And very typically what we see is we go into the backyard and we see what looks like the Amazon rainforest, big, huge leaves, vines climbing up the trees, just a mass of exotic plants. So these aren't necessarily invasive species, but they're non-supportive plants. So we have huge philodendrons with huge leaves taking up a lot of space, elephant ears, arbicola, 
We have flowers like bougainvillea and we have crotons and Hawaiian Thai plants. And we consider this non-supportive. Non-supportive plants cannot, does not create habitat. If you walk back there, it seems like, oh, wow, it's lush and it's full and it's, it's, there's something going on in there. But it's really lifeless because there's, there's no nectar. If there is, it's very little. There's no pollen. There's no berries being formed in a lot of these shrubs. And if they oh, are, they, are they end up invasive. Um, and so using native plants creates habitat in your yard for pollinators and, and birds. Oh yeah, next. So what we call this, we call this a tropical paradise disaster because you don't even have to plant some of these plants. You can just set a pot of pothos down and it'll grow up a tree and root itself into the ground. Um, and so after about 10 years, it's just a mess. And we come in and we have to clean it all out, start all over again. And people ask us quite often, and they might have oak trees as a canopy, but they still say, where are all the birds? There's no birds in this yard. And this is because they're using non-supportive plants instead of plants that are very specific for, for pollinators and birds, especially during migratory season. And even on beachside, we hear a lot of people ask us, well, there's no bird, you know, songbirds don't live on beachside, but there's a reason for that it's in their neighborhood. There's a, a dead understory. And so we like to recreate the understory. So there's this movement. I don't know if anyone's heard about it. It's called the Homegrown National Park. <clears throat> and this is what we are promoting and supporting. Um, if you go to homegrownnationalpark.org, you can read it. But they're saying basically the same thing we are, is that there isn't enough conservation land. There's not enough land out there that's being protected by the states and by the government and being set aside and managed for wildlife to support biodiversity. <clears throat> so populations of birds and populations of insects and populations of butterflies and bees, I mean, insects and I mean, everything, reptiles, amphibians have all been declining drastically. And we, we all have probably heard about this <clears throat> and it's pretty sad. Um, the majority of the land use in North America is in urban development. And so as we all have our own little space, we need to think about our own little space as part of the national park system. We have to create, or we should, it would be beneficial to create little pieces of conservation land in our property. Now we can't restore, you know, vast, you know, huge, huge scrub speed. There's, you know, you can do it on a small scale. <clears throat> And there's a huge amount of productivity that can come out of a very small space. And we have seen it over and over again. One little yard in the middle of an HOA with miles of sprayed <laughs> green lawn around it. And there's just life and bees and bursting out of this one little yard. So they can make it across miles of sprayed toxicity to a yard that has what they need in it and they can survive. And I'm talking about small things like bees and um, bees and butterflies and pollinators and then the birds. <clears throat> so we encourage everybody to take the challenge and um, start planting in your yard. And so how do you go about making your yard part of the homegrown national park movement? Well, it seems pretty simple uh, because native animals need native plants. You're going to Go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, that was <laughs> so plant some native grasses, plant some native um, shrubs. We've got some shrubs and grasses in this picture. Going. Plant native wildflowers. So this yard is specifically for bees, as you can see. But when you start planting, it's not everything comes. The bees come, the birds come, the butterflies come. And then these are young, but planting native trees is super important. Trees in general are always important, but when you plant native trees, it's, that's the beginning step. The canopy is 
I mean, it's all important. These are young. These are about a lot of these are about two years old in this picture. We don't have a, a good um, yeah. mature yard yet, but um, and so it's people a good ask start. us why, where did the bees come from once we plant in their yard, and the answer is they've been flying past you this whole right. time. They just, keep they just never stop because it's either lawn or just philodendrons or something that they cannot use. Um, so bringing life to the landscape. These are some examples of things you might see if you step outside when you have native plants in your yard. Um, because what you plant really matters. It matters to all these little guys. It matters to you. And it matters to your neighbors and your, um, the conservation land down the street. It matters to the lagoon. Um, and a lot of people, we, just, we, we really realized that people didn't think about that so much when we start talking to people. So, all right, so we're moving on now to <laughs> not all native plants are created equal. So when you have a, a small space and you want to do your maximum benefit in that small space, um, planting keystone species is, where, is a good place to start. So keystone species are species that have a, um, a disproportionate amount of value to them. So it's not just one or two things that's going to use a, a keystone species. There's lots and lots of different, whether it's birds and bees or pollinators and different animals are going to use it in different ways. Um, and then also planting for specialists. So we have a picture of goldenrod up here. Goldenrod is a great plant for specialists because there are specialist bees that only use goldenrod. So there's different insects that will only use one type of plant. And so if you plant for the specialists, the generalists will benefit also. Where if you plant where only generalists, um, for only plants that only generous, generalists will use, you'll be excluding your specialists. <laughs> so um, planting for specialists is important. And they've become a specialist through competition. And so there's certain bees that they just, they'll be dormant they're not gonna compete with all the other species of bees until their plant flowers and then they come up and then they nectar and they get pollen, the eggs, feed it to their babies and then they're, they're done. That's it, that's all they do for the whole year is they only feed on this specialist plant. And there's lots of different specialist wildflowers that certain pollinators and bees can only use that pollen through all this time through evolution. So there's a researcher, his name is Octalamy. I don't know if anyone has heard about him. He's written quite a few different books. And this is just a great little quote that we found in his book and we wanted to share with you. Um, he's very good at communicating. Um, and so he, he just talks about how, if we all planted, how easy conservation would be if plants gave everybody the same thing, basically. You know, you could plant a eucalyptus tree and it's a beautiful tree, but really only koalas are getting the benefit from it. You can plant buddleia, the butterfly bush, and it's gonna help butterflies, but there's only one butterfly that can use it as a host plant and it's not gonna help the generalists. I mean, it only helps the generalists, not the specialists. So once again, knowing what you're planting is super important to maximize the benefit of what you are planting to be able to help more than just a koala in Australia. And you could, you could plant your whole yard in native plants and it can be completely lifeless as well because there are native plants that have adapted defenses to get, not get eaten by something. Um, if you had a whole yard of ferns, there's not much can eat a fern. They're really tough. <clears throat> They've adapted really hard ways for uh, letting other, plant, other animals eat them. There's no flowers, there's no nectar. And so being specific about the, the, even the native plants that you plant um, can create much better benefits for the wildlife around you. So this is Doug Tallamy again. He has lots of grad students who he has go out and have things like count caterpillars on trees. So he can do really um, great work and find which plants can be the most beneficial. So. Um, this is a list that he created of species, of trees. So when you plant a tree to maximize your benefit. Um, the number there, like 557, 557, is the number of moth species 
that will use the oak tree there are any oak so oak quercus is oaks it's the genus so there's 500 diff different species of moss that use oak trees and there's 456 different species of moss moths that use cherry trees mm -hmm. and so as you can see right so these are north american plants <clears throat> so as it goes down the list you can see it's um showing how many different species will use these trees so you could choose to plant the ones that are i mean we we in the ideal world, we could plant them all, but normally we have limitations. <laughs> um, so you can maximize benefit by choosing the keystone species that are good for you. <clears throat> um, and so why is it so important to have moths in your yard? We always joke that we are butterfly gardeners, but we're also moth gardeners. Um, because moths are basically the bottom of the food chain for birds. And so if we want birds in our yard, we need to have moths in our yard too. Um, because moth babies, I mean, <laughs> bird babies rely on moths to survive. Um, birds don't feed their babies seeds and berries. And even things like grasshoppers and beetles are too like stiff and sticky and leggy and they're hard. So caterpillars are the best food for baby birds. And if you look at these numbers, these are on chickadee nests, but it corresponds over to like blue jays or cardinals or um, woodpeckers. They need a lot of food, <clears throat> lots and lots of caterpillars. What is it? Six, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars for one clutch of um, chickadees. And those are itty bitty birds. And so that's a lot of caterpillars. And, and when you have an oak tree in your yard, you don't notice that there's that many caterpillars up there. But if you took the time and sat out there and climbed up in the tree with binoculars, you'd be, you would see all the stuff going on up there. And we don't even notice it when we're down on the ground. <clears throat> all right, next. Mm -hmm. Your turn. Uh, so when we do uh, landscape design or we're planting in someone's yard, we think of um, the components that's going to make the, the yard more wildlife friendly and also be aesthetically pleasing at the same time. Um, so there's certain different um, components. So first you have, we think about having a layered landscape. So we want to have a canopy, an understory, and an herbaceous layer. Um, that's how the natural world works. And so we have different creatures, different animals, even butterflies that only stay in the canopy or they only stay at the ground level. Um, the Moth and butterfly host plants are typically the canopy, but a lot of times they're um, shrubs as well. So the live oak is our southern oak, but any oak will do. And as we saw, they're a host of 557 different species of caterpillars. Um, you could plant maples. Red maple is our native uh, maple tree here in Florida. Uh, they're host to 297 different species of moth caterpillars. You could plant willow. Our native willow is the Carolina willow or the coastal plains willow. Um, they get about 15 to 20 feet and they flower in the spring. They're really fragrant flowers. They attract pollinators. And these are also a keystone species. They are host of 455 different species of moths throughout North America and all the willows in North America. Um, also a host to the viceroy butterfly, which is a monarch mimic, is a ho the host on the willow. So these are very specific relationships between the plants and the insects and the moth. Um, they've specialized to these genuses, like these moths have specialized to these particular, um, like an oak or, or a maple. And then, so those are some examples of canopies. Um, then we think about the understory, whether it's in the sun or the shade under the canopy. Um, we want to have a, a full simulating an ecosystem. Um, we plant shrubs with berries and seeds. Um, beautyberry is one of our the favorites. It, they have um, lots of lots of berries in the fall during migration season. Um, they have so many berries, a lot of people ask us, um, why aren't the birds eating my berries? But they are, you're just not seeing them. It has a lot of berries. And so it's a lot are left over. Um, and they kind of reproduce a little bit in your yard even after the berries drop. 
but they're very beautiful. They get about six feet by six feet wide. They can take the shade or the sun. Um, great food source for the birds. And they're also edible. They don't taste that good, but they're, they're kind of minty. Um, but you can eat them if you wanted to. Simpson stopper, uh, another understory shrub. It can grow in full shade or full sun. Um, berries, loaded with berries in late fall. And this is during migration season. So we are in the, the North American um, neotropical bird migration along the coast here. They're heading down towards South America. Um, and so they need these carbohydrates. They need berries for migration. So they need the protein from the caterpillars to reproduce and feed to their babies. And they need carbohydrates from berries and seeds to use all that energy to migrate across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, neotropical migrants end up down in South America, a lot of the species. Um, so the, the berries are there because they've adapted and they've evolved with these plants. The plants want their seeds dispersed, and so they have all these berries right when the, the migratory birds are here in the fall. Um, these are also edible. They are in the guava family. They taste a little bit like guava, if you use your imagination. Um, they're kind of tasty. Um, beautiful, beautiful shrub, small tree. Firebush, our native firebush, Amelia patens. Um, this one is practically an ecosystem in itself. It attracts lots of butterflies when it's flowering. Blooms pretty much all year except the coldest months. Um, the hummingbirds will come to it. This is the best plant for hummingbirds. They're migratory here. They're only here in the, the fall and the spring when they're moving through. And most likely they're looking for firebush. Um, they eat a lot of insects as well, so they'll come down to that. But then this has berries in the winter months. Um, lots of juicy berries for the birds as well. And Christmas berry is kind of another one that a lot of people aren't familiar with. Um, it grows in with the mangrove systems, kind of coastal, near, it takes the brackish water really well, it gets about eight to 10 feet. Um, beautiful flowers, and lots of berries for the birds. So the pollinators and butterflies come to the flowers and the berries are eaten by birds. And fiddlewood. So fiddlewood is a coastal shrub and it is, Definitely a bird food source. Um, in the fall, it'll have berries. It has very fragrant flowers for the pollinators. And in the summer, we're starting to see it's getting very heavily defoliated by a moth caterpillar. So there's a fiddlewood moth that hasn't always been in this part of the state as heavily as more in South Florida. Um, fiddlewoods are beautiful shrubs. They get about 15 to 20 feet, but we suggest people use them kind of maybe in their backyard because they do feed the birds. But this is one that will get very defoliated by caterpillars all summer. Um, and it, the caterpillars won't leave it alone. So there's a lot of caterpillars in there. And it doesn't, most of the time it doesn't kill the shrub. It will grow back and be beautiful in the winter months. Um, it'll have berries and flowers, but it definitely is getting defoliated more now than it what used to. Along the barrier islands, when we drive up and down A1A, you can just see it's just kind of obliterated by the moth caterpillar. And we don't good suggest it's good, good bird food. And we get very disappointed when we hear people, ah, sprayed it. Because those are, you know, if you, if you have one and you don't like it there, either transplant it or put something else there. We don't need to kill the caterpillars. Um, they will feed the birds. They don't eat them all. <laughs> um, and even vines. This is corky stem passion vine. So passion vines are a host plant to the zebra longwing butterfly and the gulf fritillary butterfly, but they also produce lots of berries, tons of little berries for the birds and the cardinals really love them. Um, just a great plant all around and it'll grow in shade or sun. It takes the salty air along the dunes. Sometimes you see it growing as a ground cover right behind the dunes, it grows in the shade, hot sun. Um, but lots of berries for the birds. And then you get to enjoy the butterflies and the caterpillars. Um, it's a great host plant. And then we, we think of nesting. So you want to incorporate to have the whole life cycle exist in your yard. So you can have host plants for caterpillars so that they can raise their young, but we also need nesting shrubs for the birds. Um, so we, there's a few specific shrubs that are very good for, for birds to build nests in. Wax myrtle is one. Wax myrtle is very stiffly branched. It can take it a little moist. Um, they're great nesting. 
Um, this is a vireo that built a little hanging basket nest. Um, they also have berries on the females. They're separate male and female plants. Um, and they're a host plant to the red banded hair streak butterfly. Um, that butterfly um, is one of the little hair streaks. They're little blue guys that flitter around. So it attracts the butterflies, it attracts the birds, and you might get baby birds if you use wax myrtle. Uh -huh, but the important thing about oh. wax myrtle, sorry, just a side note, is that the butterfly <clears throat> pupates in the leaves on the ground. Oh, uh, yeah. So another side note is we always tell people to leave the leaves. And there's a reason because why they call them leaves. Right, it's because you're supposed to leave them. You're supposed to leave them because <laughs> caterpillars and insects and um, beetles and lots of things overwinter in leaves on the ground. And so it's a very important um, layer in your landscape is the leaves on the ground. Yep. <laughs> so it's always a good idea to put beds around your oak trees so that you can have leaves fall and you don't have to mow over the roots and you don't have to mow up the leaves because there's pupa in there that need to reproduce and complete their entire life cycle. Um, Florida privet is probably one of the best nesting shrubs. If you look inside an old and a Florida privet shrub, you'll see an old mockingbird nest just about always because they just, it's stiffly branched. Um, it's really tight, it's really hidden. It has berries and it has beautiful flowers in the spring that the pollinators go nuts over. The, the native bees love them, honeybees love them. And it does have berries as well for the birds. And then sweet acacia, another really good one for birds. This one's really thorny. Um, it's a small tree or a big shrub. It gets about 15 feet, about 15 feet wide. Um, they're very thorny, so the birds like that. They can build a nest in them when it forms a bit of a thicket and gets tight. It kind of keeps snakes and other predators out of the nest from eggs and, and the chicks. Or, um, or wild cats. Like or this, cats. This little baby bird was um, sheltering from stray yeah. cats. We had a little baby <laughs> mockingbirds in our backyard and uh, there were neighbors cats around so they love the, the sweet acacia because the cats will not climb that tree. Um, and then it flowers in the winter months so for snowbirds this is a great small tree to have. It starts blooming. It's super fragrant for about five months throughout the winter. Uh, and saw palmetto this is considered the most important wildlife plant in North America, I mean, in Florida. Um, it, it, just about every creature you can think of uses it from this little skipper butterfly to black bears, like everything uses saw palmetto. There's lots of fiber um, that the animals use for nesting. There's beautiful flowers that are super fragrant and there's over 150 different species of pollinators on it at the same time on those palm flower stalks. Um, it's a host plant to two skipper butterflies, the monk skipper butterfly and the palmetto skipper butterfly. Um, just a great uh, palm that is really not being replanted enough. This one, so we always try to put in a saw palmetto and a slash pine in every yard because those are the ones that are most getting wiped out through development. Um, so we want to get these young ones, young ones back into people's yards. So pine trees too. <laughs> They're also on the keystone species list. Oh, the pole right there is the pine tree. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the herbaceous layer. So the herbaceous layer is the ground layer. Um, we don't want to mow. So we want to have wildflowers on the ground so that things can live in the, in the ground herbaceous layer. layer. Here we have a sunny wildflower. This is a typical butterfly garden idea that you use these native wildflowers. It doesn't always stay in one place. They reseed and they move around. And so each season, it'll look different. Um, and so this can be under your shrubs. And then that's your lowest level. And that's where the most nectar and most pollen is really being created. Um, the, here we have partridge pea, which is a host plant to the yellow butterflies, the sulfurs. Um, coastal verbena and coreopsis, which is our state wildflower. Um, in this picture, this one we have blue curl, which blooms in the fall, and it's a great seed source for birds as well, but a great pollinator plant. And then um, underneath the little bird bath there is blue-eyed grass, and that blooms in the spring. And so when we create gardens, we try to have flowers throughout the year, because what we need to know is that bees and Butterflies are active pretty much all year here. So we need to have nectar and pollen everywhere all the time. 
everywhere and all the time because they're always active here. There's really no uh, complete dormant period even in here, even in Florida. Um, also, we have the native porterweed and um, lakeside sunflower. So different colors, different sizes. Oh, that's the next one. That's you want to go over Jumping ahead of yourself. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so in order, so once again, maximize diversity in your landscape, you want to have different colors, shapes, <laughs> and sizes of wildflowers. Um, here we have two examples, the snow square stem and bladder mallow. You can see the bladder mallow is the flat, open-faced flower. So insects that want to land and feed can land on the flower and walk around and collect pollen where the snow square stem has a tubular flower. Insects that want to hover or have longer tongues will use the tubular ones where they can fly around and lick the pollen or nectar out of the tubes of the flower. Um, you can see the horse mint in the middle has a very deep tube-like, or you can kind of see, anyway, <laughs> it has a tube-shaped um, flower. And so the, the bumblebees love horse mint. Um, horses like it too, but we don't horse garden. Um, and we try to prevent them from getting in our gardens. But the bumblebees, <clears throat> they go, they get drunk off of horse mint. And so they just dive around in there and drink out of the tubes. You can see the Florida paintbrush, they kind of walk around on top of it. They don't have to hover. And Caryopsis is another open face flower that the little pollinators land on and walk around in. Scrub mint, you can see that big hole, they have to dive their heads in there. So another one, the bumblebees disappear inside of. False indigo is one that they hover. So little butterflies and bees, they, you often find them just hovering around that with their nectaring while they're flowering. And then yellow top is a really, really heavy attractor when it flowers in the fall. Um, you see a little, they'll land on that and they'll, they'll land on the open face flower and crawl around and, and drink the pollen out of the, uh, pollen and nectar out of the flowers. Um, I think, any more? Aha, so that's it for some examples. So we just want you to think about when you're out there looking at plants, we want you to think, is it exotic? Is it invasive? Is it non-supportive? Because if it is, we're not buying it. And if it's invasive, then you just have to tell it to talk to the hand. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So we are open every Saturday and Monday um, up here on Irwin Avenue. So if you want to come and see us, <clears throat> we have all Florida native plants, so you don't have to worry about that, except we do still, do still sell blanket flower. Yeah. We haven't cut it from our repertoire. <laughs> um, but um, we hope you have been inspired and maybe we'll think about what you're planting. And the worst thing you can do is put an, out, an inside plant outside. <laughs> so house plants. Well, thank you for coming and thank you for listening. And we hope you enjoyed it. And does anyone, do we do questions or I don't know if we do questions or not? Sure. <laughs> are, you, are you willing to stay a little bit late? People want to ask some questions? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. okay. Are we okay with that in the Zoom world? Um, thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. No worries. Yes, you guys did awesome. Thank you so much. If anyone back here has any questions, you can write them down on your piece of paper. Steve will come around and grab them. Um, and if anyone on the chat has any questions, feel free to write in now. All right, so we do have a couple that are already in our Q&A. First one is, is Australian pine the same as she-oak? Hey, Tim. Oh, I don't think so. Sorry. Do you know what she-oak is? Oh. Uh, Get up here, you're not in the picture. I think. Hmm. Well, I, I don't, don't think, think it's a real oak. Yeah, well, I it's don't think it's Australian quintus. pine. It's, um... What's the other word for it? Yeah, it's an it's a um, it's not exotic Australian pine. pine though, right? Yeah. It's not Australian pine. No. <laughs> right. Whether whether it's yeah, common it's names are very confusing. Which one? Awesome. And uh, let's see, we got a couple more that we can go through. Thank you for answering that. Yeah. Um, why are invasive plants still sold? That's a great yeah, question. We would like that answer. Yeah. There needs to be an education paint campaign. There needs to be an education campaign against them, I think. Um, it's, it's an interesting that there are a lot of them that are not 
available and it is illegal to sell them. Um, what we've recently learned is that, um, so there's a separate list called the nauseous weed list. And that one is more geared toward agriculture. And so there's a lot of plants that are, are outlawed because they harm agriculture. So it's an economic thing and not an environmental thing. And um, kind of part of our idea is that we're trying to get people to, to shun these plants and push to not buy them and, and maybe eventually you know, figure out a way to push them to not allow them to be sold because the state spends millions of dollars every year taking these things out of conservation land and they're using so much resources and energy and not um, just conservation land, like water bodies and all sorts of out things. Of the, just yeah, yeah, in so. order to keep a lot of things functioning, invasive species have to be removed, especially in waterways. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Awesome. Good question. Great. Um, this next one is, is it important to plant natives particular to your zip code? Zip code is a little bit close. Region... Um, the, the, so the, the hardiness zones, like if it's going to freeze or not, is, of course, important, as we just found out this weekend. <laughs> um, <clears throat> pollinators and insects are fairly specific to regions, too. Like there are definitely South Florida insects and North Florida insects and things like that. So when you're going for host plants, it is, uh, it is important or, you know, it's something to consider. Yeah. Um, as far as how precise, like some native plants do only grow in one county in the panhandle. You know, there are very localized plants. Looking at it on a conservation, you know, restoration type thing, you know, we think we're trying to keep biodiversity alive. And so if these plants that grow in one county on in the panhandle on the West Coast, um, if that county is on, being developed, if we are able to have some of them in our yards down here, maybe we can keep biodiversity alive. Um, it, it is something to consider. We do stretch boundaries a little bit. We definitely have brought some North Florida plants up here and some West Florida plants over here. And South Florida. And, you know, Keys plants. Keys plants. Um, typically, the North Florida ones won't come down here. They won't survive. Um, so... Zip code is probably not quite as, yeah, it's a little bit yeah, more flexible. We don't get flexible. quite that um, specific. Um, there's a, another reason to use native plants is to, because they're adapted to Florida, they're adapted to the sand, the lack of nutrients in the sand. They don't, if you're using the right plant in the right place, they don't need fertilizer. And so if you were bringing a plant that you thought it was pretty from South Florida, it's most likely still adapted doesn't need it's not from the rainforest where it's super nutrient soil um, and it wouldn't need like a lot of extra care um, so we don't really think that it's you know you have to be quite that specific gotcha all right this question um, addresses when you go to the store it says why does it seem that native species are more expensive than invasive plants um probably because they're not as popular and so they're not propagated as much um, and the invasive ones are really easy to grow and they're grown in large grown scale in really, yeah and so you have a huge corporation that's putting out these plants whereas when you find native plants it's usually small growers and so it's that's the supply and demand and it's interesting there are native cultivars which we are very irritated at that they sell in home depot and so the native cultivars, they don't provide the same benefit to the native pollinators because as soon as you start changing the plant, in order to get a larger flower, you have to give something up. And it's typically like availability of pollen or so, you know, there's these blanket flower cultivars. It's like, or there's blazing star cultivars. And it's like, well, you know, it's kind of a good thing, but we don't know how much is being taken away from the pollinators in these cultivars. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to combine two questions here that sort of have to deal with your services. So one question is saying that this person is having a terrible time growing butterfly plants in shade. Do you have any recommendations for that? And then sort of along the same line, I think for you guys, would, would you do site visits to help guide people? We do. Yeah, we do site visits. We do um, consultations. Um, 
And yes, it is challenging to grow things in the shade. There are, um, there are a few different butterfly plants that we recommend um, for shade areas. Um, corky stem, the, the vine that we had up there on the presentation, grows very well in the shade. And there are very specific butter, the, the zebra longwing actually um, uses it only when it is in the shade as a host plant. Um, and so there are, you know, it's, there is an option of things in the shade. Um, but to be honest, you don't get as much color in the shade. Like it just doesn't happen because there's not as much resource <laughs> in the shade for food and light. Awesome. All right. Uh, can you totally get rid of grass? Replace it with what? Well, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you could replace it with, if it's in the sun, sunshine mimosa is a great turf replacement. Frog fruit's a great turf replacement. Uh, flower bed is a great flower turf bed. replacement. Yeah. Uh, you could have trails going through your yard instead of turf. If you need an open space, the mimosa, frog fruit are the two of the, the widest growing ones that form more of a turf and can be mowed if you have grass mixed in with it. So we have um, locally, there's the Native Plant Society and the local chapter here, which is Conradina chapter. Do, they do a really great um, yard tour once a year. It's a really great way for people to experience native yards. You can go around, you um, sign up online and you get a ticket and they give you the addresses of these houses that they've lined up that you can go and see how people have used native plants and how they are living in the landscape and you can get ideas and it's just a really great way for people to get out and see what other people have done with their native plants and how they're doing and stuff like that and we always encourage people to um join conradina chapter which is the native plant society native um, people who love native plants and teach about them and learn about them <clears throat> and the yard tours typically in october in the fall so look for that look for that it's awesome great. we'll be on the lookout for that for sure what about pond habitats and Florida natives? Oh, yes. Lots of um, pond edge plants that we try to grow as much as we can um, to provide these pond plants and edge plants and the shoreline plants. Um, it's a very good, you could create a lot of good habitat. And we see some pretty pathetic ponds around um, in that are just like grass right down to the edge and they're spraying the edges and it's just, and having can really um, create a lot of habitat on the edges of ponds. Yeah, and I mean, it takes up nutrients too. A lot of the pond plants will help yeah. reduce nutrient levels in water. So yes, definitely another great area to be planting um, native plants. Yeah, pickerel weed and, and duck potato or two that we typically grow. Um, we try to have it in stock all the time, as much as we can. Um, blue flag iris, some yellow canna lilies. Um, some leather spike fern. rush, leather fern, there's so many. And we, we try to grow as many species as we can. We kind of run out of room all the time. So um, we, we try to grow a lot of diversity, um, which gets us in trouble sometimes because then we end up with that, without enough space to grow at all. So um, you should be able to find some at our store. Right on. What role does mulch play in native gardens? So there's lots of different types of mulch. So like we mentioned earlier, leaving the leaves is really important. Um, so oak leaves are a fabulous mulch because they make a layer. Um, and so are pine needles. Mm -hmm. we, um, it makes us cringe when we see people raking their leaves or their pine needles because we buy pine needles and put them in people's yards. You can buy them in bales and lay them down. And then other people are raking them up and throwing and them away. it smells good and it looks um, beautiful. <clears throat> But even wooden mulch, like your typical, okay, so first of all, everybody should know that you should never use cypress mulch. Yes, cypress mulch is extremely unecological and unsustainable. Cypress trees grow in wetlands, and when they harvest them, it totally changes the, um, the ecology of the wetland. So no, no cypress mulch allowed. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> when you use other kind of wood chip mulches, it's, 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 um, it's not as good as leaves but it's better than grass um, in a way that you don't have to mow it and use resources. But you, we also don't encourage people to like take out all the grass and put down mulch because things grow in mulch also. So in Florida, 
we have a lot of water and a lot of sun, which is really good for things to grow. And so we want to guide what is growing instead of trying to stop things from growing. Um, sometimes people like to make big, vast mulch areas, which is okay for, you know, like a sitting area or something, but like a, or rock areas or another people like to do rocks and things, everything grows in rocks. It's not like they're not going to grow in that. So we try not to encourage um, large areas where you're not having things growing because you're fighting things growing, trying to keep that place open. Well, anywhere um, that there's open space, something will something grow. Will try just and the grow. laws of nature that if you don't put something you want there, something you don't want is going to grow there. But mulch for walkways is great. Yeah. And it is good for keeping moisture and keeping, um, it does encourage um, decomposition in the soil and microbes and worms and things like that. Awesome. Is there a good resource for identifying existing plants in your yard? Hmm. Um, there are a lot of apps that yeah. people use all the time. Um, you can take pictures and send them to us and yeah. we might be able to identify them. Um, because identification is important. Like it, you, you know, there, yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of things growing out there. Um, <clears throat> iNaturalist is pretty good. That's an app. I've heard of lots of other ones that people get. <clears throat> and they're normally fairly accurate. Um, they're not always accurate, but they are normally fairly accurate. Um, and yeah, that's, that's part yeah. of the challenge too. It's, it's fun. Take pictures. What is this? You can text them to our phone number or email us. Any if pictures that you want to send us? Um, because a lot of times we'll go to your yard and <clears throat> we will show them all of the native plants that have been growing there. And they're like, well, I've been pulling that out for years. Um, and so like the corky stem passion vine, very often we talk to someone and we're like, that is corky stem passion vine. And they've been pulling that off their shrub for like, or out of their grass for like six years. And now they want to buy one and put it in. So it is a good idea. And frog fruit as well is all, quite often in your yard already. Um, and so we tell you that's frog fruit is a host of five different butterflies. There'll be little holes in all the leaves. We, we love to see holes in the leaves. Um, when you see holes in your leaves, that's a good thing because that means it's sharing its resources with, with animals. Um, but yeah, feel free to, you can text or email us pictures. And if you have a, a flower or a seed, it's also helpful yep. instead of just a leaf. <laughs> right on. Um, how do we get you to do a home visit and make a plan? Um, call us or email us. Yep. Great. And call then again, your address is 82 Southwest Urban Avenue. That's right. Or come in and talk to us. Yep. yep. And phone number again is 321-626-7386. Oh, our email's not up there. Our email is nativebutterflyflowers at gmail.com. Beautiful. <laughs> you mentioned porterweed. How can you tell the native from the invasive? Uh, well, they're hybridizing. So, right. So the, the, the invasive one is the tall one. It's very easy to tell which is the, 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 um, the non-native one. It's normally it's about six feet tall. It's than waist high as an invasive. One. Yeah. And it has a dark blue flower or a dark purple flower. <laughs> The native one has, it's a low growing, um, very horizontal growth. So it grows kind of along the ground and it has a, a more lavender colored flower. Now the issue is that they have been hybridizing. So we get kind of a medium sized one now that grows at about two or three feet, um, but it still has a, a kind of violet colored flower. Um, and this is a plant that there's disputes of whether we should be growing it or not. Well, um, we would encourage people to get rid of the Asian invasive one because it's causing it pretty hard for us to grow the native one because we'll collect, we'll find seeds and they end up hybridized and they get about three feet. They're, they're not. So it's making it harder on us to grow the native ones because there's so much of the other one around. All right. I think we have a question in the audience. Oh, it's still being written down, so we'll wait just a second. Here's an interesting one. Can pet waste be incorporated into native plant fertilization? Pet waste? Yes. Oh, uh, <laughs> it's all the bacteria. Right. And... I wouldn't just leave it in the leaves. <laughs> yeah. It is, you know, you can bury it and put it in like I a compost. Know. I wouldn't put it on your vegetable garden and stuff like that. I mean, that. if you're changing out your fish tank, that would work. 
Um, Cause yeah, because definitely feeds dog plants. waste and cat waste yeah, that's has a lot of bacteria in it. But you can, it can be. There is some documentation about how well it has to be composted and stuff before it becomes non toxic. Mm. Um, but it, you know, if you leave one area that you leave as the toxic pet waste area where it breaks down, because <laughs> it, it does have a lot more bacteria than you know, it's, it's got stuff in it that's. Yeah. You wouldn't want to put it on your vegetable garden, kind of. Thing. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. All right. Our question from the audience is a double question. It says, is milkweed okay? And what about herbs such as dill and fennel? Uh-huh. So, okay. well, you can start. Okay. So um, the native milkweed, there's about 26 species of native milkweeds. And we grow the pink milkweed and the white milkweed. And there's a smaller one called world milkweed. Um, they're great. They're dormant in the winter. Um, great for the, for the monarchs and the queen butterflies. Um, we also grow host plants for the black swallowtail. We grow water dropwort. These are the native species that they use and mock bishop's weed. Um, so yeah, uh, and fennel and parsley is good for them. Yeah, fennel, fennel and parsley don't provide any threats or damages as far as yeah. any kind of ecological. But we would certainly there. say um, native growing milkweed the milkweeds, has... yeah, is important to use the natives um, milk when it comes to milkweed. They're, the um, tropical milkweed is a species of concern. Uh, the Florida Pest Plant Council is concerned about it. They haven't listed it as a problem, but it is a species of concern for lots of, for a few different reasons. All right. Um, so typical gardeners, oh, this keeps moving around a little bit. Typical gardeners cannot use the list provided by FLEPPC because they are sorted by scientific name. Is there any consideration to produce the list sorted by common name? That would be really helpful. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's better to use the scientific name because common names can be, you might get something different in a different part of the world if you try to use common names. Um, Google is very uh, helpful. If you have a common name, you can Google it. Or species. Or species. Yeah. yeah, right. If you have a scientific name. If you have the name. scientific name, Google it. Um, the common names are on the list, but they're not organized by the common names. Yeah. So if you know a common name, it's harder to find it on the list. Um, yeah, this is the I think you can challenges. go to their website, too, and type in the common names, maybe, and get it on their website. All right. Do you work with other native nurseries or gardeners from across the state? This person wants to create a network to create pollinator corridor- corridors from east to west, north to south coast of Florida. Cool. Woo-hoo. That's right. That's awesome. Yeah, we certainly would. Yeah, we're big supporters <laughs> of the other native nurseries. Um, go to FANN is the Florida Association of Native Nurseries that we're members with. Um, and you can find all the native nurseries in Florida. Um, we communicate with them quite a lot. When we run out of plants, we go to them. We're very lucky to have some amazing nurseries, especially over on the west coast of Florida, that are um, very producing lots of plants. And so, don't tell it. Don't let anyone tell you that it's not available, because most likely, it's out there somewhere. That's Someone's fun. growing them. Yeah. So yeah, Fan has a great um, resource guide for where you can where the native nurseries are. Um, if you look on the F-A-N-N, is it .org? .org? Yeah. They, uh, it has all the ones in the state <clears throat> listed on there. All right. Now, if you're planting natives in your yard, such as beautyberry, firebush, privet, wax myrtles, how long would it take for them to flower? Um, so our motto, it, especially for shrubs, is the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. So the third year, by the third year is when you really start to see your plants like expand and fill out and really start being like a noticeable, healthy, yeah. you know, happy growing shrub. I mean, a firebush can, fi- um, thanks for coming. Um, a firebush <laughs> can flower the first year, yeah. you know. Um, wax myrtles do it's have to well. mature. They, they yeah. do take a few years before <clears throat> they can start um, burying. Yeah. Privets, they, they're they flowering in the pots, you know, as little two foot high shrubs. And so some of them are, it can be the first year, 
some of it does take a little bit longer, just depending on the species. And what we see a lot of times is that when we will plant a yard, you'll see the pollinators first. And so you'll see lots of, you'll see butterflies coming, you'll see pollinators and be native bees coming to the flowers, but you won't see a lot of birds at first because your shrubs have to grow up. And so there's a ecological succession. And so first it starts with these pioneer species that are flowering and they're low and they're wildflowers and they're reseeding. And while that's happening, your shrubs are maturing. And then as your shrubs start to mature, like that third year, then you start seeing more life come into your yard, the larger life, like the, the different birds that are trying, they're looking at the shrubs as a place to live. Um, and then it just starts to um, mature after that. And if you have trees mixed in, then you start to get a canopy. So it's a, it's a, a period of ecological succession when we do a new yard. Awesome. Also sort of relating to that question, what's the difference in growth periods between native and non-natives? I mean, it's, it's pretty species specific. Wildflowers, any of the wildflowers or herbaceous plants pretty much will fill in the first year or within the couple, uh, first couple months. Like Tim was saying, it's kind of like succession. The wildflowers fill in first, then the shrubs will kind of come along after that and then the trees. So, and they don't need fertilizer if you're using them in the right place. You have a, a sandy yard that's well drained. Um, you plant plants that are adapted to that. Water them until they're as big as you want them. Right. I mean, just water them. So we yeah. typically say water every day for a month and twice a week for two to three years to get them established. It does depend on your soil. Unfortunately, a lot of the new developments have really awful soil. <laughs> and so it's gonna, it takes time to get soil um, alive, basically, again. And so watering does really depend on your soil, but typically water is the limiting factor in plant growth. Can I ask a question to build on that? Because I think that really is key in new development. How do you, Can you suggest some ways that people could amend their existing soil to try to encourage that biological growth <laughs> that has been depleted during yeah. the development process? Do you have any suggestions for that? Oak leaves. Yeah, so this is <laughs> where mulch to comes leaf. into yeah. play, like just getting organic matter into the soil mm -hmm. and planting pioneer species. So some, spe some, some species are very specific to their soil type. Like they need certain pHs or certain alkalinities and they want it well drained or this that and the other but then some <clears throat> don't care like doing sunflower um, as long as it's not too wet or grasses are really good so once you start getting roots and organic matter into these soils then it starts bringing the soil to life and this is soil that's like fill dirt like clay right. or marl if you have sand you're good you don't need to amend sand Native sand is what we want to see Sand and yeah. water are the best two things you could pretty much combine for native plants. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you don't need organic marley, matter, really. You don't have to put compost in. If you have a sandy yard, you're ready. It's the problems are these newer developments where they raise them up with clay, and um, there we found molding clay. And it's like yeah, and shell and stuff, and so just like mulch and organic matter, and then getting these pioneer species that can get their roots down because once the roots start getting through all of that nastiness other things will follow and life will start coming back into the soil but it's 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 picking the right species for your soil really and so pioneer species is what you need love thank it thank you perfect how much uh, can we keep you here or you know we get 115 where are we we're i mean we're all right yeah we do have some things to do, but eventually it'll be all right. All right, continue. <laughs> all right, we can, we can end on this okay. one question. This oh, is, yeah, this is a nice one questions. that we're going to love too. Yes. How do you encourage communities to stop spraying pesticides, including government and oh, yeah, county yeah. mosquito commercial spraying? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. If we do, uh, we, uh, we, we're wondering the same thing. <laughs> I mean, it's all about education. All and I mean, what we've really found is just telling people that they don't have to spray is a really good starting point because a lot of people just do what everyone else is doing and they think they have to spray. I mean, there's, it, <laughs> your yard will change when you stop spraying it, but you have to be open to that. And then you have to be, if you're willing to 
work with that change. And we're uh, we always tell people they're like, oh, my grass is dying over here. We're like, great, now we don't have to kill it. Like plant some wildflowers there. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> like because otherwise you have to kill your grass. And so if your grass is dying, plant something more useful there. Um, but yeah, the spraying thing is it's a cultural thing, and we just have to work on your neighbor. And your county. Um, and your county. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we another thing is it's like we really do have winter in Florida, even though a lot of people don't think we do. And so grass does change color in the winter. It doesn't have to be green all winter. You know, we, we do have seasons down here, even though it's not as obvious. And so plants aren't growing as much at this time of year. They are more dormant. Um, just accepting and knowing that I think is part of the the education campaign. I think that's actually a perfect place to end. And I want to thank you again. And if those of you that are left can give them another round of applause <laughs> well, for coming. For having us. We're very happy to have you here. And I encourage you. I mean, everybody's been hearing me say, you know, take out your turf grass, disconnect your turf grass. So okay. now you've got an awesome resource. I don't care if they can see me on okay. the Zoom, but like, you guys are the important ones. <laughs> but you've got your resources right here. You know how to contact them. When you're ready to get rid of your turf grass and disconnect your lawn from the chemicals that are killing our lagoon, you've got a resource. You can reach out and make your lawn a lively place that's bringing in life and not death. So thank you guys again. Oh, thank, thank you. Being here. Thanks for everyone. Thank you all in the Zoom world. Yes. I'm going to say thank you. <laughs> Bye. And report card coming soon.